So today we're going to get going on a set of topics that uh, I, I put them together because they have to do with uh, coordinate systems that are different than just an XY coordinate system. And we're going to start with one that's called a normal and tangential coordinate system. So the big deal with a normal tangential coordinate system is that the, uh, the coordinate system basically travels with the direction of motion. So if you imagine there be a motion of a particle through space, um, it has a particular velocity. What we do with the normal tangential type of coordinate system is we attach the, uh, you know, the tangential part of the, or the tangential coordinate to the direction of motion. So wherever it's at, we, as we assume that the tangential component of motion um, is going to be in the direction of, of motion. Right? So that's the idea. And because of that, we can say that the velocity vector is going to be uh, equal to whatever the velocity is uh, times a unit vector in that tangential direction. We can say that because we defined it that way. We say these, this coordinate system basically follows along with the motion. And uh, that, you know, because of that, the unit vector in the tangential direction, um, you know, it's going to basically be tangent with that path anywhere we go. All right? So that's kind of our starting point with the normal tangential uh, coordinate system. But it gets a little bit tricky when we get into acceleration. All right? Velocity is easy. When we get into acceleration, it gets just a little bit more tricky. And the reason it gets more tricky is that basically what we have to do is we have to, in order to uh, take this derivative of this vector to find acceleration, right? Acceleration uh, is the derivative of what we had up there for the velocity vector. So v times this unit vector in the tangential direction, OK? And uh, what we dealt with when we met last time was uh, a type of coordinate system that stayed fixed. Well, today, we don't have a coordinate system that stays fixed. And because of that, we don't have a really nice simplifying uh, situation that allows us to say that this unit vector uh, u sub t is going to be constant, all right? It's not constant anymore. It's changing with time. And because it's changing with time, that means we have to figure out what we mean by that, all right? So that's going to be part of what we talk about here. The first thing we can do is actually just look at this as being a plain uh, product rule kind of a problem, all right? The product rule on this says that our acceleration vector is going to be equal to, we'll take the time derivative of v first times the unit vector in the, in the tangential direction. Okay, but then what do we add to it? Well, we add to it the velocity without a dot on it times the unit vector in that tangential direction with a dot on it. Okay, so that's just plain product rule right there that we implemented. Okay, and I would say that the first term in that expression is probably not confusing. It kind of makes sense that whatever our acceleration uh, is in the tangential direction is just going to be v dot, right? That part of it makes sense. But we have to deal with what we mean by this uh, unit vector dot, okay? And so we're going to have to do a couple of things to get there. The first thing let me do is draw a little picture of a particle moving along a path, OK? So the first thing I'll do is show a little path right here, all right? And as a particle moves along this path, it might start in one location and go to another location. And in each of those locations, it's going to have a particular radius of curvature associated with the path. OK, would you agree with that? So wherever the, the particle's at, and however it's curving, we could define what the radius of curvature is instantaneously at that point. And because what we're going to do next is say that this travel that this thing goes on from here to here, OK, is infinitesimally small. 
All right, we're just going to say it moves a little tiny bit along the path. And because it's a little tiny bit, we will call that ds. Well, since that's just a little tiny bit, it's, it's uh, fair enough for us to just say that the radius value pretty much remains constant within that uh, motion. So we have, we'll use a, a Greek letter rho to talk about the radius of curvature of that path. And uh, because it is curving, there is some point where these two lines intersect each other. And that's basically kind of a center of curvature as this thing goes along. And now that we've defined those two things, we can also say that this angle right here, we can call that d theta. Okay, again, because ds, that's an infinitesimally small length, it means we can also say that this uh, little slice right here is infinitesimally narrow with that angle, all right? Hence the, uh, the d theta. All right, so, so far so good. Uh, what I want to do with this is actually just do a little bit of really simple geometry. Um, if we measure theta in radians, do we remember the definition of radian measure? Okay, radian measure is what? Okay, it's basically equal to the ratio of two things. What are they? Arc length over what? Radius, okay, so if you have a longer arc length, that basically means that you are measuring more of an angle. If you take the ratio of an arc length, which in our case is ds, right, over the radius value, that gives you an angle measured in radians, okay? Well, how, does that, how is that useful to us? This is just the definition of what a radian is. How is this useful? Okay, would you say that I could go in here and uh, for instance, say that d theta, which is, again, just a measure of an angle, and I'm assuming that angle's in radians, is going to be what? ds over rho. Okay. So far, so good? Like, that's, you know, that's pretty basic. All right. Well, let's actually complicate it just a little bit. Let's say, now that we've kind of come up with a geometry of that, let's say that ha that also happens in an infinitesimally small period of time, All right? So it moves from the first location over here to the second location over here, and it takes an infinitesimally small period of time that we will call dt as it moves, okay? So that tells me here that I can take this expression and I can turn it into d theta dt being equal to, and over here I'm going to change this just so, ever so slightly. I'm going to change this into 1 over rho times ds dt. Okay, and I could do that because it's happening over this infinitesimally small period of time dt. All right, well, this is kind of interesting because I've kind of written in fancy format here a couple of things that we basically uh, know what they are. On the left, I have what we could call theta dot, okay? And in some texts, this is called omega, all right? That is an angular velocity. Is a, you know, more written out name for that thing, angular velocity, okay? That's what I have on the left side of this expression. On the right side of the expression, I still have 1 over rho, and what would you call ds dt? Okay, I would call that a velocity along the path, right? Or you could just say it's a velocity, but it's a velocity in a particular direction. It's a velocity moving along that path. And so I'll just call that v. Okay, or another way to write this is that theta dot is equal to v over rho. All right, that's kind of step one. Remember, we're, you know, you kind of have to go with me here for a little while because um, trust me, we're going to the place where we can deal with this expression of acceleration where I've got this 
uh, unit vector in the tangential direction dot. But I need this relationship first. And this relationship really isn't new, it's, but it may not have been stated in these terms for you before. All right, so the next thing I need to do, this is really the crux of it, I need to imagine there being a unit vector associated with this path at each of these locations. Okay, so there's a little vector that I'll draw right there, and I'll call that maybe uh, u sub t sub 1. And there's another unit vector that's associated with this location right here, and I'll call that u sub t sub 2. And because the path is curving, those are not pointed in the same direction, right? Both of them are tangent to the path, but since the path curves, they are not in the same direction. Uh, when we describe velocities um, like this, we can kind of relate velocities together with vector sums like we do with any other vectors. So how, does, how do vectors sum together? Y'all remember? Okay, you can kind of do a head to tail kind of an arrangement. Or one way to do that is I could set this up to where I show a u sub t uh, one pointing like this, and then there's another one like this. You know, this is our u sub t sub one, and this is u sub t sub two. Okay. And if I want to know the difference between these two, basically I'm asking what do I need to add to the first one to get the second one? Would you agree with that? If I'm trying to figure out what the difference is between these, I basically need to say, what is the length and orientation of the vector that I need to add right here in order to get to that other vector, okay? And it probably makes sense to give that a name. We can probably call that d u sub t, okay? Because that's how we do everything else is we figure out a, these d values based on the difference, right? So we're saying we found the difference between 1 and 2, and it's that little vector that points right there, okay? Well, how long are u sub t1 and u sub t2? Like, how long is this vector? There's a reason we, ha we use the letter u there. It's because it's a unit vector. And because it's a unit vector, it has length of 1. And this one has length of 1 as well. Okay. Now, one last relationship that it's going to be a little bit hard to squeeze in there, but I'll, I'll give it a try. There is a relationship between the angle of these two things. Okay. What is that right there? Well, it should be related to the direction of the two uh, lines that I drew right at the beginning, right? The, the two lines that go from the center of curvature out to the path, right? This is just d theta. Okay. All right, and so because of this, I can basically go here and say, I'll do it in a different color to make it stand out. I'll say that d u of t, or u sub t, the unit vector in the tangential direction, that value right there is going to be equal to, in magnitude first, let's think about magnitude. How long is that little vector segment right there? If I know that the length of those vectors is 1, and the angle measured in radians there is d theta, then how long is u or is uh, d of u of t? Okay, well, it'll be one times okay d theta. But I don't want that to remain a scalar value. I want to make it a vector value, right? Because this is the magnitude. What I've got measured there so far is a is a uh, magnitude, 
if I want to know the direction, I need to, or if I want to include the direction, I need to include a unit vector that goes the direction that I want. Well, what direction does that little d uh, of the unit vector of t, what direction does that little piece go? Well, it's perpendicular to the original directions of like ut1 and ut2 that you see right there, okay? And perpendicular is just a unit vector in what we would call the normal direction. All right. Well, now what we can do is similar to the last thing that we did in our, in our previous um, step that we did up there a second ago. We can divide both sides of this by dt. All right. We can say this happens over some infinitesimally small period of time. And what do we have on the left? Well, that is u sub t dot. All right, that's what, that's what we have over here. This is going to be the time derivative of that unit vector. Okay, and we can clean that up a little bit because this theta d theta dt right here is just theta dot. All right, so this is just equal to theta dot uh, times this unit vector in the normal orientation. Okay, all right, so now let's actually do one last substitution here and we will say that this uh, unit vector in the tangential direction dot is going to be equal to, I'm gonna substitute in uh, this theta dot into this, okay? And we will say that this is just going to be equal to uh, V over rho Okay, times a unit vector in the normal orientation. And now that I have that, I can go back over here and define what my acceleration vector is. My acceleration vector will be equal to V dot times the unit vector in the tangential direction plus V Okay, I just bring the V down that I had previously on that line, times, now I can substitute in what I had for this unit vector in the tangential direction. I can substitute that in up here with V over rho times my unit vector in a normal orientation. And usually you don't leave this written in that format. Usually you collapse those velocities and you say that this acceleration is going to be equal to the acceleration along the path, that's what V dot is, times uh, U sub T, right? That's how you know it's along the path, plus V squared over rho times the unit vector normal to the path. And this is a huge equation right here, all right? This is a, this is a big one, so I'm going to put a box around it. Okay, let me uh, kind of describe these things. This, again, I think I said these, but I'll, I'll write them on here. This is an acceleration along the path. And this right here is what is called a centripetal. Acceleration. Right? And an interesting thing about the centripetal acceleration is that it is always inward uh, into the curve. So if you, as you look at the curve right here, I would say it points toward uh, inside of curve. Always. Right. 
And this is also kind of neat, or at least I think so, it's neat that now we have something that's related to a radius of curvature. That's something we can sort of geometrically understand, right? We can understand the idea of a radius of curvature. All right, one last little thing I need to touch on, and then we'll do a, a quick example with this stuff. Okay, last thing I need to touch on is we have other expressions for radius of curvature. And I'm not going to spend time to re-derive this. This is something that is, you know, kind of in any calculus text that you might pick up. Um, it is the idea of another expression that we can use for a radius of curvature. Okay, I'll say this is the radius of curvature given a path function. So if you have a mathematical function that describes the shape of a path, uh, you can figure out what the radius of curvature is at a point using a particular uh, expression here that I'm about to give you. And this is it. That radius of curvature is going to be equal to 1 plus the first derivative of y with respect to x, okay, this is if you are in kind of xy space, squared, okay, all of this to the three halves, this whole thing gets divided by the second derivative of y with respect to x. Okay, or if you want to state this, you know, I'm trying to make sure you get the idea of a difference between a dot derivative versus a prime derivative. If you're talking about, you know, kind of this spatial derivative, um, it's okay to use a prime notation. So one plus y prime uh, squared. All this to the three halves over down here, you could just say y double prime. Okay, and again, this is if you know the shape of a path in xy space. Okay, where this is basically f of x. <clears throat> All right. So far, so good. We got the idea of centripetal acceleration uh, and acceleration along the path. Let's do a quick example. Okay, let's say that we have a package that is sliding down a ramp, and this ramp is, uh, the shape of the ramp is given with the function that I show right there. Y of X is equal to 0.1 over meters squared X cubed, uh, minus one over meters times X squared plus 2.6 X. Okay, um, we're given here that the speed along the path of that package is given with the log of t over seconds, okay, meters per second, all right? And what we want to do is we want to find the acceleration vector at the instant shown, okay? Right there at the instant shown, it is at an x-coordinate of six meters. It is also at a, uh, at the time of four seconds. All right, so this is not kind of at initial time. This is after that speed function has been allowed to elapse through four seconds. Okay. All right, so what do you think we should do first? We're going to use this expression that I just derived up here that I put in the box. Acceleration is equal to V dot uh, times unit vector tangential plus V squared over rho times unit vector normal, all right? One of the things I would say that we're going to need is our radius of curvature. And we just got finished saying that we have this way of finding the radius of curvature given that we have a path function. So let's go ahead and do that part right now, okay? So what we need to do is to find a first derivative first, I guess, of y with respect to x, okay? So y prime, what is y prime going to be for this expression, okay? The first term there, we take 
the exponent out in front and then lower it by one. So that gives me a 0.3 over meters squared times x squared. The next term I have minus, okay, again, the exponent out in front, 2 over meters, and I lower it by 1. So I just have x plus, here again, the exponent out in front, that's just an exponent of 1, lower it by 1, this just gives me a 2.6. All right. Now, one of the things I want to know is what is this when we plug in an x value of 6 meters? Okay, so y prime at x equals 6 meters. Okay, all I got to do there is uh, if you've got a calculator, it makes it re really easy. You just put it in as 0.3 times, okay, I'll plug it in 6 here squared minus uh, 2 times 6 plus 2.6. All right, so this gives me a value of 1.4. Let me ask you the question, what should the units be on this? This is, a, this is a spatial derivative, meaning we're taking a derivative of y with respect to x. And so what is the geometric meaning of a spatial derivative like this? Would you say it's a slope? So you have a rise over a run. That's the physical meaning of it. And if it's a rise over a run, then that means that the units actually turn out to be not there, right? It's unit over unit. They go away. But you can see that if you go in here and you actually plug in like a 6 meters into x squared, for instance, that knocks out the meters squared with meters squared, right? And then we have, uh, you know, 6 meters we plug in for x here, that knocks out those meters. So it ends up being a unitless quantity. So we can just say that's equal to 1.4. All right, what about the second derivative? Because we're going to need that too for our radius, radius of curvature function that we have up there. Okay, for this, we just take the derivative again. Exponent out in front, lower it by one. Okay, again, we take an exponent out in front, lower it by one here. All right, and I take this, and for y double prime, I plug in a particular x value of 6 meters. And when I do that, it gives me, let's see, 0.6 times 6 minus 2. Right? So 1.6. What are the units on that? Okay, well, one of the terms you can look at here doesn't even have an x involved. It's just going to be equal to 2 over meters, right? So these are basically units of. Uh, one over meter, right? All right, so there's our two derivatives there. How do I find my radius of curvature? I probably need to see this thing up here, don't I? Um, one plus y prime squared. So radius of curvature is going to be equal to one plus y prime squared, all right, and then all of that gets uh, raised to the three halves, and I divide by second derivative, which I just found right here, 1.6 times 1 over meter. All right. 
And so this gives me Let's see, 1 plus 1.4 raised to the second power. All of this raised to the 3 halves. Oops. And then in the denominator, I have 1.6. So far, so good. So this gives me a radius of curvature of 3.183. What are the units? Meters. All right. Now what? Okay. What I'm supposed to do is find this acceleration vector. I have a little formula up here to find the acceleration vector. It is this right here. I'll tell you what, I'm going to try to copy this and bring it down so we have it in our view while we're working this. Okay. This acceleration vector is found with this expression. So this tells me that I need to find V dot, all right? What's V dot? V dot will be D speed DT, right? Okay, that is what we have here for V dot. And so that means I need to take a derivative of log of t over seconds times meter per second. How do I do that? Remember what the derivative of the natural log function is? Okay. If you don't remember it, it turns out to be 1 over t. Okay. And the units on that turn out to be in meter per second. All right, so then we plug in our value of t. We're saying that this is shown at a time value of four seconds. That's just given information. So that means we're four seconds into this log function. All right, so we'll say that, uh, you know, v dot at t equal four seconds is going to be equal to 1 over 4 seconds times meter per second. All right? And this ends up just giving us 1 quarter, right? 0.25 meter per second squared. All right, so that's one of the things that we need in this formula in order to be able to find our total acceleration vector uh, for this box that's sliding down this ramp. What else do we need? We probably need just the plain V value, right? Not V dot. And so in order to find a plain V value, we just plug in uh, the time value of four seconds into our original speed function, right? So up there, we basically have uh, speed at four seconds. Is going to be equal to the log of four seconds over seconds, all right, meter per second. Okay, so I'll just calculate that. This just ends up being basically the log of four. And that gives me 1.386 meter per second. 
All right, so that's one of the things we needed. This was another thing we needed. And then we also needed our radius of curvature. Now I can determine what my overall acceleration vector is. It is, and this is with respect to normal and tangential unit vectors, right? So we have acceleration now is equal to V dot, V dot was right over here, 0.25 meter per second squared. Okay, multiplied by the unit vector in the tangential direction plus V squared, all right, that's just going to be this 1.386 meter per second, and that is squared, divided by rho, which is 3.183 meters. And all of this gets multiplied by the unit vector in the normal direction. All right, and if we want to simplify that down, we can. So 0.1836 divided by 3.183 gives us 0.4355. So what this ends up being is 0.25 times a unit vector in the tangential direction plus 0.4355 times a unit vector in the normal orientation. All of this is in meter per second squared. Yeah. Did I not square it? Thank you. Appreciate you catching me on that. So 1.386 squared over 3.183, appreciate that, 0 0.6035. All right. What's nice about, the, um, about this particular type of coordinate system is that you can sort of categorize what kind of acceleration you're talking about, right? You can say, are you accelerating in the direction of motion or are you accelerating because of the curvature, right? That's, you know, they sort of have the two different causes of why you're acceleration or why you're accelerating. Either you're being driven faster or slower along the direction that you're moving, or the fact that you're curving uh, means that you're accelerating in a normal direction to the direction that you're actually moving. Conceptually, it makes a lot of sense to do this. What do you think the downside or the tricky part is of using normal and tangential components like this? Well, I'll say since they're always moving, right? Yeah, if we check on these just a few seconds later, then your normal and tangential unit vector uh, directions will be in a different orientation. They'll, they'll actually move on you, right? So they have a lot of meaning relative to the path. They don't have as much meaning relative to the global world, right? But it actually makes sense to do it this way sometimes because, like, for instance, consider if you're driving a car, right? You're driving the car and the car is moving along the road, but what you're experiencing is much more attached to the car, right? So you experience, uh, when you hit the gas pedal, you experience the car pushing in your back and driving you to a faster speed. That would be a, an acceleration along the path. When you're moving along at a constant speed and you try to you know, turn around a corner, uh, then what happens is you feel yourself thrown to one side of the car. What that actually is is that your car is trying to accelerate you toward the inside of the curve, right? And you're reacting by, I don't really want to hold myself up, so you end up falling to the outside of the curve, right? That's the classic, you know, for some of you that you've probably heard of, the idea of is there centripetal force versus is there centrifugal force, 
right? Centripetal force is actually something that is more real because it is what causes uh, objects to end up moving toward the center of the curvature, right? But what you experience as the thing being moved is that you don't really want to move that way. And so you end up with this centrifugal effect, which is you uh, essentially bucking that idea that you would move to the center and instead fly outward. All right, so if you like you're attached to a spring or something, the spring applies the centripetal force, but the spring may actually allow some motion in the other direction because it's actually pulling. It's pulling to the inside, but the inertial forces are actually pulling to the outside. We'll get much more into that when we get into the idea of kinetics around this stuff. Right now, we're basically just looking at the kinematic side of it. All right, questions yet? Wonderful. It, the truth is you can ask questions. I know I've been sort of trucking along. I don't, I don't know uh, if you all want to ask questions, but you certainly are welcome to. We don't have to maintain a particular schedule as we uh, move through these just because we're recording them. <laughs>